Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'd like to begin by introducing you to a new online event, These Bloody Days, The Fall of Anne Boleyn. I'm absolutely thrilled to share that the brilliant Dr. Owen Emerson and I have teamed up to bring you a week-long online event exploring Anne Boleyn's downfall, beginning on Monday, 13th of May, 2024. Through a series of six pre-recorded lectures and one live Zoom discussion, we'll delve deep into one of the most brutal and shocking events of Henry VIII's reign. We'll examine the courtship of Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII, the great matter and Anne's rise to the throne. We'll look at how Anne and Henry's relationship evolved once they were married and chart the main events of 1535 and 1536. We'll delve into the arrest, trial and execution of an anointed queen and look at what took place in the aftermath of Anne's tragic fall. Participants will be entered into a special giveaway and have access to all recordings for two months after the event ends. For lectures, outlines and to reserve your place, just Google these bloody days, the fall of Anne Boleyn event bright. I do hope you'll consider joining us. I'd also, of course, like to acknowledge and thank the wonderful listeners who continue to support Talking Tudors on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. As an independent podcaster, this really does mean a lot. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors Patreon family. Please visit patreon.com slash Talking Tudors for more information. When you join the patron family, you will instantly unlock access to exclusive posts, including audio releases and videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and to take part in a member-only book club. They can also enter patron-only monthly giveaways to name but a few of the perks. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtutors.threadless.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the podcast to chat about Catherine Carey is Dr. Wendy J. Dunn. Wendy is an award-winning Australian writer fascinated by Tudor history, so much so she was not surprised to discover a family connection to the Tudors, not long after the publication of her first Anne Boleyn novel, which narrated Anne Boleyn's story through the eyes of Sir Thomas Wyatt the Elder. Wendy is married, the mother of three sons and one daughter, named after a certain Tudor queen, surprisingly not Anne. She's also the grandmother of two amazing small boys. She gained her PhD in 2014 and loves walking in the footsteps of the historical people she gives voice to in her novels. Wendy also tutors at Swinburne University of Technology, Australia. Let's dive straight into our conversation. Welcome back to Talking Tutors, Wendy. How are you? Oh, I'm very well, Nat. How are you? I'm well, thank you. It's so lovely to have you back on the show. It's been a number of years, actually, since you've been on. So I suppose a good place to begin is you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about you and your background. Well, I'm obviously um, into the Tudors big time and I've been into the Tudors all my life. And I think that's really the most important takeaway about that question. Got into the Tudors when, as a child and it's turned my life into this wonderful adventure of learning and passion and has led me to um, write four Tudor novels that are published out in the world and now this non-fiction work which was just actually it's being released in Australia at the end of this month but it's already in the USA and also in England available at amazon.com yeah so thank you the Tudors well Anne Boleyn and Elizabeth really for setting my feet on this path 
Absolutely. Well, I'm, I totally agree with you. What an adventure we've been on. And so the book that you're referring to is Henry VIII's true daughter, Catherine Carey, A Tudor Life, which is very exciting. And we're here to talk about this new work today. So, Wendy, why did you decide to write a book about Catherine Carey? Well, you know that my second Anne Boleyn novel that stepped out in 2014 was in the voice of Catherine Carey, the teenage Catherine Carey. I imagined her in the last months of Anne Boleyn's time as Henry VIII's queen, being at the court of Henry VIII and, of course, her, her beloved aunt, and trying to work out what was actually going on in that time. So she was flung into the really the cesspool of the Henry VIII's court, and, of course, that ended up with her aunt being executed. That was a work of imagination. I wasn't expecting to write a non-fiction book about Catherine, but I was approached on Twitter by a commissioning editor... And of course, I checked to see if this person was legit because you get approached by all kinds of people online. Um, and I discovered that this person was truly who she said she was. And she offered me three projects that she said, would you be interested in writing about one of them? And one of them was about Catherine. And I was already fascinated by Catherine. It was just like, like an invitation to learn more about her. Of course, I was absolutely terrified that what I would discover would prove that, you know, my novel was completely fantasy rather than, you know, I, as a writer of imagination, you have instincts that sometimes you find that your instincts is completely right. And I do feel that um, what I wrote about my novel would be regarded as definitely based in reality um, but I definitely was terrified by write, by writing this non-fiction book that it would turn out to be completely horrible you know all my all my research for the novel would have been proven to be completely up the creek with no paddle <laughs> but anyway it's worked out well <laughs> oh well I'm glad it all worked out and and yeah she's a fascinating character and I think people are quite interested in her so so Wendy let's let's start at the beginning then in terms of Catherine's life story what do we know of her family and her early life well we know that she of course is the daughter the eldest daughter of Mary Boleyn obviously it appears that Catherine was Mary's firstborn um she was born during Mary Boleyn's marriage to William Carey. We don't know for certain about her birth year, but there are strong arguments for her being born in 1524, and I think that's where we're definitely an early 1524. Um, so she was born into the Boleyn family in a sense because William Carey was of a lower gentry, and of course the Boleyns at that time were on the up and up and the Boleyns were of greater presence than um, William Carey, who was the lower gentry. And of course, with being a Tudor girl, she would have been educated as what you would expect of a Tudor girl. But of course, she had the extra layer of being of the Boleyn family. And as we know, with both Mary and Anne, they were educated well. Both of them were literate and both of them were readers. And we know this by Mary's letter that she wrote to Cromwell. So so Mary Boleyn would have probably um, ensured that her daughter had the same education path as what she did, you know, learning languages and learning about the classics and all the things that um, a well-educated Tudor girl would have been learning in that time and, and also being godly and making certain that she knew what it meant to be a good girl in Tudor times, which meant that you, you really stuck to what the Bible told you to do. And so, yeah, so she would have had the same path as what normal Tudor girls. So she would have been also expected to be put out at a certain age. That could happen from the time she was eight to the time she was 14. So I can't say this is exactly what happened with, with Catherine because she's another Tudor person that everything is really murky and we can only really look at her mother's life and sort of, yeah, this is what is probably likely to have been the case with Catherine too. 
Yes, that's the issue with so many Tudor women, paucity of sources is sometimes incredibly challenging and frustrating. But I suppose we do know that she certainly had some very interesting, fascinating women as role models. You mentioned, of course, Anne Boleyn, her aunt, and and I'm just thinking Elizabeth Boleyn, her grandmother, and uh, Margaret Butler as well. So she certainly had strong characters around her, which is fascinating. Her mother too. Yes, of course. Her mother, Mary Boleyn, exactly. Her mother deserves to be regarded as as definitely a strong Tudor woman because she chose to follow her heart. Anyway, we're good too. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So let's now dive into this question of Catherine's parentage that I imagine lots of our listeners are thinking, come on, let's talk about this. So where do you stand on this particular question, Wendy? And maybe you can just tell us what the, the question is that people debate here. The question is whether or not she was sired by Henry VIII. And as the title of my book says, Henry VIII's true daughter, there's no question in my mind that Catherine was indeed the daughter of Henry VIII. Writing this book actually has now swayed me to really, I mean, I didn't think Henry Carey was also fathered by Henry VIII, but I really think he was as well. And that's a quite interesting situation about Henry, because when Henry was conceived, um, Henry VIII was in a relationship with Anne Boleyn. So this it sort of gets really, really murky, doesn't it? But I think there's enough evidence there to also say that Henry was fathered by Henry VIII. What's the evidence? I'm going to talk about the evidence that other historians have mentioned. The conclusions that I have drawn in my book, I want people to read my book to find out further, but there is a lot of what other historians have put on the table for us. We know from Henry VIII's own mouth that he was in a sexual relationship with Mary Boleyn. And it appears to have been a relationship with, which lasted for quite a few years, um, maybe two years, maybe even three years. It could have even happened prior to her marriage to William Carey, which explains the hasty marriage to William Carey. She didn't have any children until, well, One of the possible birth years for Catherine Carey is 1522. So that's two years after her marriage to William Carey. But we, like I said, the the stronger arguments for Catherine's uh, year of birth is early 1524. So that is definitely when, during the, the duration of Mary's relationship with Henry VIII. We also have the interesting naming of a ship the Mary Boleyn late in 1523, which I think is smoke sort of celebrating the fact that Mary is pregnant. So he's he's celebrating that he's going to be a father. In 1524, we, we also see a number of grants coming to William Perry's way. The interesting thing about this is that after his death, Mary Boleyn was able to keep at least one of the grants I can think of. She kept getting money from that grant. So it's evidence that Henry VIII is paying for something here. And then we also have the fact that after Anne Boleyn was executed, the Boleyn families were definitely not looked at with favour at the court of Henry VIII no longer wanted to have much to do with the Boleyns after Anne Boleyn's execution. Yet we have Catherine becoming one one of the women, one of the girls selected to be the small group of women who served Anne of Cleves. And that was a very, it was very difficult to get into that particular role. It's very competitive and everything like that. All the families were desperate to get their daughters as close to the king and or queen as they could, you know, so that they could use those daughters as ways of shoring up their power and also to ensure sure those daughters married well so they were dealing the daughters were associating with the right crowd of people um so there there we have Catherine Carey who is still very much part of the Berlin kin um she's selected as one of those favoured girls for Anne of Cleves and she also served for a short time 
Catherine Howard as well. And then once she was married in 1540, which was just months after serving Anne of Cleves, she was actually given with Francis a, a property that, that uh, the Nolises was trying to, they had lived in this property, but it didn't really belong to them entirely. And after her marriage to Francis, this property through the king's own power was made jointly owned by Catherine and Francis. So there's, there's a lot of things that sort of suggest that Henry VIII is keeping an eye on the career of this young woman. Definitely lots of food for thought there you've given us. There's more in my book. <laughs> There's more in your book. Yes, exactly. We need to go there. So in terms of, of Catherine Carey, when people think about her, a lot of the other things that come up are to do with her relationship with her aunt, Anne Boleyn. And of course, the question of whether she witnessed Anne's brutal execution in May 1536. So did you find out anything, Wendy, around that situation? No, not really. I mean, we know the smoke of the legend. And that, to me, I really always believe where there's smoke in history, you'll find the fire. And you've got the example of the legend of Troy. You know, um, Troy was lost to history but for many many centuries people were talking about there's a city down there the joy was underneath the ground and of course it was discovered that they they did find troy um in the 19th century at least what they believe is was troy and there's other examples that we can draw from where people have investigated the smoke i would love us to find a document to to prove once and for all because we do have that old legend that Catherine Carey was with Anne Boleyn and in her last days and also witnessed Anne's execution I I believe it but I wish I, I could prove it to people but I think we can only speculate that this is this could be the case Okay, and let's talk a little bit more about Catherine's career at court that you've already briefly sort of mentioned, because of course she does go on to to then serve other Tudor monarchs. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Her service, her early service. Well, yeah, her career at court, yes. This, yeah. this is quite interesting, the fact that she, when she did enter into Anne of Cleves' service, that sort of does sort of indicate that she's had experience at court prior to 1540, she would have been, you know, with, with regards to being a, one of the women closely regarded, not at around Anne of Cleves. Anne of Cleves, of course, didn't have English uh, when she arrived. So she would have been one of the people to help Anne of Cleves settle in and to be able to communicate her needs and everything. And so being one of those small group of women around the Queen comes with a lot of responsibility. It's a duty that is, you know, they would have been in service to that person, to the Queen, from morning to night, dealing with, you know, organising clothes, checking um, everything is as it should be, preparing the bedchamber. So definitely um, in a position of power. So, yeah, so, you know, it was, it was a job that involved a lot of organising of servants and it was a full-on role, a role with a lot of responsibility as well as being part of the court as well. Young girls were expected to walk a very uh, straight line of behaviour. We know that she entered the service of Anne Cleves when Anne of Cleves arrived in England in 1540, but then she married also, uh, Catherine Carey, married in April. And after that, she did serve, like I said before, Catherine Howard for a short time. But Catherine's life became that of pregnancy and giving birth for years. She, she almost had a year, a baby a year. So she was away from court as well a lot during this period. Okay, and you mentioned Francis earlier, presumably that's Francis Knowles, the man she marries. So do you want to tell us how her marriage to Francis came about? Do we know about that? We have two schools about this. Francis Knowles was a soldier as a young man, very, very much active young man. He was about 10 years Catherine senior, so he was 26 when he married Catherine. But at that stage, he was a soldier, and um, Catherine's stepfather 
William Safford, who was married now to Mary Boleyn, was a soldier as well. So one thought is that the marriage was arranged through William knowing Francis, which is how a lot of these marriages were arranged. The other school of thought is that uh, Francis's own mother, um, she actually used her power somehow to get him to being the master of horse for Prince Edward before he became king. And so, and it appears that she also had a role to play in the marriage of um, Catherine and Francis. I kind of think it could have been both of them together manoeuvring this marriage. Yeah, so Francis would have been well known at court through the fact that he had been the master of horse of the young prince. And so obviously he was very trusted by the king and must have had a really good reputation. It was definitely something that he would have been happy about, gaining this marriage with Catherine Carey. And Wendy, we also know that due to obviously their their sort of religious beliefs, they spent a period in exile, the couple, so Francis and, and Catherine. So do you want to tell us about this particular time in their lives it would have been horrible it would have been absolutely horrible um and it's quite interesting how we have the really famous letter that um elizabeth wrote in 1553 which is the year that mary became queen and that's always been put forward as the year that catherine and francis went into exile there was really no rush for them to leave at that point they knew that things were turning black but i don't believe they went especially because um, we have Catherine having a baby not that long afterwards. I reckon what happened is that the plans were put into place. I reckon what happened was that Francis went across to Germany to work out, and I've written about this in, in my book, that he's gone over to make certain that there was a place for his family to be. We have also the example of what happened with Catherine Willoughby. He did you know, exactly the thing, which is what I think Francis did, went over to make certain that there was somewhere for his family to be, and then came back and collected Catherine and their child and went across to, they also were in Germany as well. So I think they actually left for Germany in 1555. It would have been horrible because, you know, she had 11 children at that stage. I actually think that she took her older children. My theory is because she only took five of her children with her. And, and as we know, in this period of time, babies and infant, young children were more in danger of dying. In the first five years of life, so many children, tutor children died either at birth or in the first five years of their life. So I've, I've got a feeling that she probably opted to leave her younger children with her brother who was married at that time and also had a budding nursery of children. He had quite a few kids as well. I think he had 12 children as well. I think the younger children were, were left in the care of Henry and his wife because Henry stayed at the court of Mary and he was part of the court there. But the older children, in my mind, would have been more in danger because the eldest child at that time was 14, I think. So he was, he was close to being regarded as an adult and so he would have been more in danger of being grabbed and questioned for his faith. And as we know, during um, Mary's reign, hundreds of people were burnt because of their faith. So I think they would have been more inclined to take their older children who would have had more chance of survival because it was a very much a time of upheaval. I, I know Francis moved around quite a lot. We have a record of Catherine staying at a merchant's home with one servant and of course we know that Catherine and Francis were wealthy tutors so therefore she was living in quite different circumstances than she would have been used to at home one servant for five children that strikes me as being hard work you spoke about the fact that there's that famous letter, of course, that exchange between Elizabeth and Catherine Carey while she's possibly in exile or going into exile, as you've, as you've talked about. So how does Elizabeth, her cousin or half-sibling, however you want to put it, her accession to the throne affect then Catherine and Francis's lives? 
completely changed their lives. Uh, they were still in exile when um, Mary passed away in 1558. But as soon as they knew of Mary's death, they started their journey back to England. We know straight away that Catherine enters the service of Elizabeth. Catherine was one of the women who was part of the court coronation group of women. And she was, of course, in that small knot of women again with Elizabeth. So there was four women who were part of the bedchamber and Catherine was part of that group from the start. And until her death, she served Elizabeth with great devotion. Um, she put Elizabeth's needs always before her own. She had two more children after Elizabeth became queen. She would have been expected to stay with Elizabeth until just weeks before her giving birth and returning to Elizabeth as soon as she was church, which is the 40-day period after childbirth. So as part of her small group of women, she would have been part of the dressing of the queen, which took hours. Uh, could yes. take up to two hours of time and of course those four women were in a position of power as well um, they were also ears Elizabeth's ears to the court and so they would have been relaying information to Elizabeth about what's going on and all the gossip and everything Elizabeth was a very demanding mistress yeah. and we know that she made Catherine cry at times and I think that's probably because those four women would have been not only supporting the queen physically but emotionally as well and this was a really real those first 10 years were really demanding in so many ways because Elizabeth had to prove that she could stay on the on the throne she was only a young woman and she became queen at 25 so there was a lot of pressure put on her to marry um she was almost having that pressure daily yes mm. that's such a good point you make about the providing the emotional support i think that's sometimes forgotten and and you're right they were quite tumultuous years for elizabeth and i think yes must have been very challenging for catherine and the other women of course and you sacrifice a lot don't you when you serve a tutor monarch you sacrifice a lot you were expected to sacrifice yes and be and be happy and yes and count your blessings that you were in this position to sacrifice because exactly. you're serving the queen <laughs> exactly so you've talked obviously their relationship was a close one and elizabeth did rely on her quite heavily so do you want to tell us a little bit more about what we know of their relationship oh i think it was definitely a relationship that had a lot of love we have the letter but that letter actually indicates that they had known each other for years before that. And it does appear that Catherine Carey, after the execution of Anne Boleyn, was actually with her infant cousin Elizabeth. Yeah, so they had this really long association with one another uh, and devotion to one another. And of all the women that served Elizabeth, this is quite, you know, remarkable that there's never, ever anything said that, you know, Catherine never gets into trouble at all. It's it's her loyalty is so remarkable. Um, when other women close to Elizabeth got into trouble because they were trying to persuade Elizabeth that maybe this marriage is a good idea and they got too friendly with the foreign amb ambassadors, she never got herself in trouble with, with doing anything like that. It was just silence. She became the chief of the bedchamber after the death of Kat. As we know, Kat Ashley was closest to being the proxy mother of Elizabeth through her life. But after Kat Ashley died, Catherine stepped into the role of being chief woman of the bedchamber. Bed I do admire that loyalty and that that devotion is, is astounding, really. And I think the way to survive is to not have your own agenda. I think we see that often yes. when you the second you have your own agenda and they get a sniff of it, you're going to be in trouble. So I think Catherine did a magnificent job of just 
just being loyal and you know devoted to her queen but you, you mentioned there that she only had about 10 years serving her so can you tell us a little bit about her illness and and death well she was actually unwell in 1565 the year that her son henry was married in history we see the queen sending her own doctor to catherine because catherine's ill i wonder if she had malaria because that was you know one of the things that people did get in that time because she seemed to have this fever that kept on cropping up especially in the last years we got the fact that she was ill really ill in 1565 we've also got letters from robert dudley to Francis about their worry about Catherine going her own way and dealing with her health, you know, so they were worried about Catherine's diet. So her illness was not a sudden thing. It seemed to be something that came over. And when you consider that she had birthed 16 children, Francis said 16 children. So I believe Francis, because he was a very reliable uh, man, that 16 children to me strikes me as enough cause to wear a woman's health down to the ground. Yeah, so it probably was a combination of so many things. I do think it could have been the malaria because she had the fever off and on in that last illness of hers the fever came and went she seemed to get better then she got worse again and then of course she, um, she died on the day marking the coronation day of elizabeth so she, 10 years after in 1569 um, january the 15th this is a really sad story in itself because the illness the last illness lasted months poor francis was stuck looking after mary queen of scots and he was desperate to return to Catherine's side. And you got these really heartfelt letters from Francis to Catherine about, you know, wanting to be with her and can't you use your influence with the Queen to get me their home? And there's no reason for me to be with the Queen of Scots. You need me. I can imagine that he was absolutely heartbroken to hear of her death because some of their friends reassured him that she was getting better. And then, of course, she had another a relapse and she died and that's so, elizabeth obviously that wasn't giving permission for him to return which how, how did she respond then when catherine dies and she you know realizes that she kept them apart she's heartbroken absolutely heartbroken i think with elizabeth she felt that she was caring for catherine well enough that he didn't need to worry about it because i can make her better because we know that Elizabeth actually, when her people close to her were sick, you know, we've got stories about her feeding them soup and everything like that. And also, you know, the letter that she sent to Robert Dudley saying, you know, I want you to take this medicine, you know, this is just prior to his death, you know. So she was really concerned that to care for people that were close to her. And I believe that because she had the best doctors, um, she actually had Catherine close to her situated at um, Hampton Court Palace. So, you know, she was watching her, visiting her, making certain that it all well with her. I mean, she's the one that's going to make her better. What could Francis do? I mean, I could, you know, this is the thing is that with Elizabeth, sometimes she thought she had all the power, but then she was proven that that was not the case. Catherine died and she just, she actually locked herself. She was another incident of her locking herself away and she got sick herself and she paid for this amazing funeral that was fit for a royalty for Catherine. Wendy, what do you think is Catherine Carey's greatest legacy? There's no question in my mind that her greatest legacy is the fact that she was part of the, that group of women who helped um, Elizabeth seed her reign. Uh, without those women supporting her in that first 10 years, and especially women like Catherine, Elizabeth would probably have not stayed on the throne because she had the loyalty of those women, um, the emotional support she needed. We have to remember those first 10 years of Elizabeth's reign were so full of uncertainty. Elizabeth became queen with everybody, well not everybody, but, and, and I definitely know that Catherine would not have been, but the, the group of people really doubting um, Elizabeth's ability to stay on the throne for long. You know, there was people gambling about how long would Elizabeth remain queen. Yes, her legacy is Elizabeth.
Yeah, it's so wonderful that you've shed light, of course, on this this woman who supported Elizabeth, because we so often hear about the men who supported Elizabeth and Elizabeth's Privy Council. And it, it's nice to talk about the women that were there supporting her as well and that were, you know, essential, as you said, to her rule. So that's really wonderful. Wendy, I have one more question for you, and that is for our Tudor takeaway. So I asked my guests for something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode, perhaps to enrich what we've been talking about. Do you have a Tudor takeaway? I do actually. I've been reading because I'm researching a new book for Pen and Sword and the book that I'm going to give as my tutor takeaway is called Best of Hardwick and it's by Mary Lovell. I actually only knew the broad strokes about Best before reading this book. So my broad strokes was that she'd married four times um, and every time that she got married she became more wealthy. She built these amazing houses. She also was, she had a loose tongue because she got herself in a bit of strife for doing too much gossip with Mary Queen of Scots about Elizabeth's relationship with Robert Dudley. So, you know, the broad strokes to me didn't make her too appealing or interesting. Um, And this book has completely um, turned my view about Bess around. She's yet another extraordinary woman from Tudor times that is definitely worth learning about. And she lived her amazing life and um, definitely had a far, far stronger relationship with Elizabeth than I realised. And and Elizabeth really, really liked her. So there were so many things that I discovered about Bess. Seems to be a really lovely human being who I'd like to know more about. (laughs) Well, that's a wonderful takeaway. And I think the 16th century certainly produced a whole lot of fascinating women, which is why I love this period so, so much. Wendy, thank you so much for taking the time to come on to the podcast and talk tutors with us. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much, Nat. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tutors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetutortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tutors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon.